in some ways ask you guys this morning is let's just take a look what, what do you think consciousness is okay so philosophical question right and related to that is the mind versus brain debate okay but first of all what what is consciousness in your opinion as you think about that right now are you accessing your consciousness when, it, when are you not conscious, right? And so therefore, what would it be? Come on, everybody. Let's give me, give me a, just a shot. What do you think it is? Consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's not really about sense necessarily the senses then. Right. Like if you lost all your senses, sight, touch, taste, would, could you still be conscious? Okay. So it's outside the senses. Um, do you feel other animals possess it? Do you feel other objects beyond animals could possess it? Is it a factor of a brain? So do you need a brain to have a consciousness? Because uh, okay, something to think about. It's related to what I want to talk about today. All right. Okay, so this is part two. If the brain were simple enough to understand, we would be too simple to understand it. Okay, we talked a little bit last time about measuring things, and that that's a big part of science, is being able to put numbers on things. But if we consider the question of consciousness, and again, I was to ask you, how many thoughts have you had today? To put a number on that, just this morning. Actually, you guys might be able to do that. Some of you seem a little stunned, so I think maybe you could put a number on it. Um, we have no units of measurement for this. We have no units for measuring thoughts. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you could tell me when one thought ends and another begins, which is why some psychologists call it the stream of consciousness that it's kind of a constantly running thing your brain um, even some might argue when you are asleep that stream of consciousness continues okay that thought and consciousness is such an unusual thing that we can't apply measurement techniques to it it's a thought anyways okay so because of this psychology tended not to study consciousness as a scientific study but instead it gave rise to a branch of psychology known as behavioralism because we can study behaviors okay we can't sort of study what someone's thinking but we can see what they're doing we can we can kind of put a number on that how many times somebody blinks how many times someone goes to the bathroom how many times one group of society kills another group of society we can put numbers on those we can study the behaviors, not the consciousness, okay? So this gives rise to things like economics, population income, rate of inflation, okay? Those are, those are numerical values. We can quantify those. We can put values on them, okay? Okay, so we're going to look today at a simple question that had a number put on it. Who won the Centennial Olympics, okay? So there, you guys know the Olympics, right? Famous sporting event. So in 1996, there was Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States, okay? And an article appeared in the Canadian newspapers after the Olympics saying, who really won these Olympics? Here are the official rankings of the 1996 Olympics. USA was ranked number one with 101 medals. Germany, number two, with 65. Russia at 63. China at 50. And if you go further down the list, at number 11 was Canada with 22 medals. My first question to you is, is this an accurate ranking? Do you feel the United States is first based on this? Or is there more to it than this? What's, what, is there anything missing from this at this point? Sorry, what? 
How many people competed, you mean? Is that a factor? No, it's not a factor in this. Okay? Maybe it should be, but it's not in this. I mean, all it is is they counted how many medals each country won. Right? So this is how many medals USA won. And that's why they're ranked first. What if they were all bronze? Ah, what if they were all bronze? Does that matter to you? Should it matter? So right here, that might, that, that's usually the very first question people ask is, well, wait a minute, what, what if those aren't all golds? What, like, what, does that matter? Okay. So here's a more accurate viewing of the actual rankings of the gold, silver, bronze. Okay. So here you can see gold, silver, bronze. So now, in that 101, you can see the United States had 44 golds, 32 silvers, and 25 bronze. Okay. Would you still consider the United States the top country? Okay, I get that. Germany, Russia, China. Okay, but look here between Germany, Germany and Russia. There's a discrepancy, right? Germany has less gold than Russia. Should that matter? What if we came up with a system that it wasn't just about medals total, but we gave value to each medal? Like some medals were valued higher than others, because it seems like we do that already, right? A gold is considered a better metal than a silver and a bronze. So what if we took that into account? What if we gave them value? So three points for gold, two for silver, and one for bronze. Okay, so you get three for this, two for this, and one for this, and you get a point total. Well, USA still wins, 221 points. But at this point, Russia and Germany switch places. Germany, which was number two, now becomes number three on our listing here. So already it's affecting the rankings if we apply that level of scrutiny, scrutiny to judgment here. Okay? Could we go further? Hannah suggested that maybe, and I'm not sure if she was exactly suggesting this, maybe we should think about how many actual athletes were competing. Maybe Canada sent less athletes than the United States, and maybe that should be a factor. Let me throw it out another way. What if the actual population of a country was a factor? Do you think that's a factor? A country like Jamaica has certainly a much lower population than the United States. And China certainly has a much higher population than Canada. What what advantage does a higher population have on the Olympics, do you think? Sure, a larger pool of athletes to draw from. So should that be a factor? Well, let's make it a factor, okay? What if we consider population? Now, if we think of it as a percentage, number one of the Olympics is Tonga, the island of Tonga, which gets 20 points per million people. So if we rank it per million people, Canada now comes in 25th, and the United States comes in 37th on the list, with 0.9 points per million people. Tonga, the Bahamas, and Cuba are your top three. Okay, and you can see actually fairly significant difference between the island of Tonga and the United States. If we consider what the brilliant Hannah proposed, that population and size should be a factor here. But think about that. When you study the natural sciences, when you're studying chemistry, which I know a lot of you in here have, in great IB detail, parts per million is a factor in studying chemistry, right? Like, that's a thing. So why couldn't it be a thing in studying Olympics results? That the fact that this country has less athletes to draw from means that maybe they should be ranked higher because of the fact that they had to compete in a, a different sort of, it wasn't as equal for them, okay? Now, I don't have any other stats other than this one, but I'm going to ask you guys, what else could we consider? What else could be a factor here? Is there, again, think a little outside the box. What else could be a factor in ranking this? Come on, you've got to think of at least one. What, what thing dif differentiates the country? Sorry, Hannah, what were you going to say? The sport itself. Maybe some sports could rank higher than others. What would be the highest ranking sport, for example, in the Olympics? I don't know. That's a tough call. What would be the lowest ranking sport in the Olympics? Fence. How many teams are... Okay. 
So how hard is the sport to compete in, like a difficulty ranking? What else? That's interesting, very interesting. If we could apply some sort of scale to that, that would affect the numbers. What about um, a, a country's uh, overall wealth? Do you think that's a factor? Is wealth a factor? Would a wealthy country have an advantage over a, a less wealthy country in terms of Olympic standings? And if so, how? Training facilities? Training facilities? What else in the, what, what is the Olympics? Like, what kind of athletes compete in Olympics? What's their mantra? That they're amateur athletes, right? Which means they're not paid, right, to do their sports. So if you're not paid to do a sport, how do you make a living at your sport? Well, you don't, right? So then how do you afford a place to live and a car to drive and food to eat? Well, in wealthier countries, they give them that thing, those things. They give them a place not only to train, but a place to live if they're an Olympic athlete. But in the island of Tonga, I'm not sure if they do that. I'm not sure if they can afford to do that. Is there anything else you guys can think of that would be a factor of the way this ranking could change? I think you guys got some pretty good ones, okay? We could also think about the age of athletes. The eligibility factor, right? Since children and seniors um, do not really consider part of the pool of potential athletes, maybe we should factor that into that whole thing. Like, yeah, the USA has a higher population, but they also have a very high population of seniors. Maybe we shouldn't consider those part of the numbers because seniors wouldn't have competed in the Olympics anyways. Same with children, right? Um, maybe we should only factor in age 16 to 60. That's the only age range we should consider. Again, maybe we should have controlled for that in our experiment. Okay? Maybe we should compensate for the fact that the USA had the home advantage. Their athletes didn't have to travel across the world. They got cheered for by the crowds more. Maybe there should be a factor of that. Okay? There are tons of ways we could interpret data, and that's the point of what I'm trying to do here, is when you look at statistical data involving human beings, the way it's interpreted can be scrutinized and can be analyzed and, and overanalyzed in, in a very significant way. And, and it's important to think of it that way. Okay? So when you think who won, it's not an easy question. Okay? So believe it or not, this is a question that you guys would find, I think, important. Not if it's the Olympics question, but if it's a question that actually affects you guys in your life right now. Like, which is the best university to attend in Canada? McLean's Magazine puts out ra ratings of universities every year. How seriously do you take those ratings? How seriously should you take those ratings? What factors do they consider when they make that ranking? Or do you just look at which is number one, and for example, where does the U of M fall? Which, by the way, it falls very low year after year. Year after year, the U of M ranks really, really low on the list. And there's a lot of good reasons maybe why it ranks low, but maybe we should be considering other factors, okay? Be careful of how um, accurately you take sometimes listings, because again, you could think about it from different places. The difference between the island of Tonga and the United States in the previous example shows how it depends what we think about when we factor this in, okay? We do this in science, in the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, you guys consider and control for variables to affect experiments. Why, of course, do we not do this in the human sciences? Well, we do do this, but it's harder to do, and there's more to consider. There's way more unknown variables when studying humans. An economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday did happen today. Okay, so... Let's talk about experimentation in the human sciences, okay? That's your classic example of an experimenter, right? This guy or girl in a lab coat, often with the safety glasses, holding some sort of Bunsen burner or something like that. That's what you see maybe in your mind when I said scientist, right? But when we're gonna take this stereotype and apply it to studying humans, human behavior, we got some problems, and I'm going to present three reasons why, okay? One, 
what they're actually trying to study might be incredibly complex. Like, for example, consciousness. It's too complex to really get a handle on what you're actually studying. If you're studying teen pregnancy rates, what exactly are you studying here? Like, what, what exactly? Or who won the Olympics? What is the exact complex real-world situation that might be impossible to actually nail down what you're studying? Two, the experiment that you might create might be a bit artificial, okay? When experimenting with humans, what you're trying to run in the experiment might actually be kind of not the realistic thing, right? Like if you're trying to study the effect of um, babies um, or toddlers, what, what's the effect of if they're not around their mothers very much? Well, you're not going to actually remove a toddler from its mother for like its entire toddler years, so you'd set up some sort of artificial experiment just to see the effect. But that artificiality might actually not give you an accurate representation of what you're actually trying to study. And then the third thing would be the ethics, okay? Ought we actually do this experiment, okay? Is there an ethical question? Maybe the experiment itself will have a negative effect on the people studying it, okay? So this makes studying humans incredibly difficult, okay? But still incredibly important. We can't just not do this because human behavior is what we do. That's, that's what we are, okay? So we could look at the way a brain functions by looking at people who have a damaged brain, who have suffered brain damage. We could study identical twins who were separated at birth to sort of answer the genetics versus nature, sorry, the nature versus nurture debate. But we're not actually going to separate two twins at birth. So if you want to just do a scientific study of identical twins separated at birth, you're probably going to have a tough time finding that happening actually in the real world. Like this may not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's incredibly rare, okay? So as a scientist, a social scientist, you don't want to just wait around and say, well, I'm just going to wait. Give me that government grant. I'm going to wait for two twins separated at birth, and until then I'm just going to hang on to this money. No. So what you'll end up doing is devising an artificial experiment to try to simulate that environment. <coughs> but those experiments might be so artificial that the results might be speculative. It's quite possible, overwhelmingly probable, one might guess, that we will always learn more about human life and human personality from novels than from scientific psychology. That's an interesting quote, I think, right? Norm Chomsky is a, an author, right? So he's saying that, as an author, he's maybe a bit in an arrogant statement saying that you can learn more from my novels than from a psychologist about human behavior, okay? Something to think about. Okay, we saw the Milgram experiment. We actually witnessed what it was, okay? So let's just cycle, let's kind of wrap today by looking at that. You remember that the conclusion was that two-thirds of the participants of the Milgram experiment went all the way to the 450 volt uh, range, okay? This raises a lot of ethical questions. Whoa, like, how is it that humans would go all the way in a seemingly um, fatal experiment? So, as I said, when they change the experiments, the results also change. For example, I may not have mentioned this. When there was not one teacher, remember the teacher was the one that wasn't in on the experiment, but three teachers, so three people who weren't in on the experiment, but three people had to decide when the person got the shock. It went now down so that 90% of the time they would refuse to go all the way. That's huge statistical difference. And that tells you something maybe about what's going on there, that in a group setting, we'll be less likely to conform in the, in the conformity experiment than, than in other situations, okay? Now, as well, there was some study done of the Milgram experiment after the fact, and there was some of the participants said to have suffered some tra trauma from participating in that experiment, okay? Some might even classify it as post-traumatic stress syndrome, that that level of ethical question, like the fact that they, they had to think to themselves, I would have done it, I would have gone all the way and possibly killed that man, affected them, and therefore it kind of made us question should we have even done that experiment? Which is, by the way, why it's not done anymore very much, that level of experiment, because of the ethics of it. People 
don't want to sort of put themselves in that situation. Which leads to the ethical kind of question, did the knowledge we gain from the experiment outweigh the sort of negative part of it? What do you guys think? Do you think that what they learned from that experiment outweighed the negative effects of the ethics of it, per se? They're not willing to say. Do you think that's a question that human scientists should be asking themselves? And actually, not just human scientists, but also natural scientists. Not just, should I do the experiment, but ought, to, ought I do the experiment? You'd think that it should be a simple question, but the ethics of an experiment is, is for sure something considered in the sciences, whether it's natural or human sciences, but the actual study of ethics by scientists is not that widely done, okay? Few scientists actually study ethics as an actual sort of field of study and therefore apply it to what they're actually doing in their experiments. They think, what can I do, not ought I do it. Okay, which is another reason why I consider the ethical study an important study. Okay, so 